Architects in Emeryville. And um, I have been working the last few years on um, the Design Awards program, bringing sustainability into the Design Awards program. And that has included in recent years, um, incorporating the what's known as the Common App, which is a, um, an application for Design Awards that includes a lot of the measures and metrics originally from the Coat Top 10, which are now part of the AIA's definition of design excellence. So uh, today presenting about that is Corey Squire. Corey is uh, an architect and a leader of um, in sustainability at the many of the firms he's worked for, including Lake Flato, um, and is now an independent consultant with the Department of Sustainability, um, consulting with other firms on how to make themselves more sustainable. He was part of the um, COAT advisory group nationally and helped develop the Common App as well as the um, top 10 super spreadsheet. So he'll be presenting about the Common Application. There are a few other people on the call today um, who will help answer questions. Uh, me, uh, along with Bill Burke, many of you know Bill Burke, who for many years was the head of architectural programs at the Pacific Energy Center. He's also been very involved with uh, design awards and with uh, the technical review in the Common App. And um, Jennifer Devlin from EHDD is also now the Coat representative to the design awards, and she'll be on the call as well, and uh, will be available to answer questions. But first, Corey is going to present um, the Common App and, and walk you through it. Before we get started, I just wanted to uh, mention that AIA California has once again partnered with the Pacific Energy and Gas Company to provide helpful education and resources for architecture and design community. In addition to their role in the development of the EUI calculators over the past few years, Pacific Gas and Electric is partnering with AIA California to help make this webinar possible. So I wanna thank them for that. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Corey to get started. All right, great. Thanks, Henry. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna pull up the app and I'm gonna walk through it. All right, everyone can see it. So, um, so the Common App is a is a program, as as Henry mentioned, that um, that tries to instill kind of the the new AIA principles of design excellence in design awards programs. California has been a leader in this area, um, and uh, chapters, states, cities around the country have been adopting this Common App or or fairly similar programs. Um, the goal being that as architects, we can't just award projects that look good or because they look good. They have to perform, they have to function, they have to stand up for our values as architects for protecting the planet, protecting communities, protecting the health of the occupants, local ecosystems, basically the 10 measures of framework and design excellence. Now, a lot of you are already familiar with the Common App because it was used last year during the Design Awards program in California. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk through it for those who aren't familiar um, at kind of a high level. And I'm gonna just point out the, the changes and updates that have been made since last year. Um, basically the Common App is divided into two sections. On the top, you're gonna to have very typical project information, starting off with the project name, um, the address, um, cost, use data, some questions about 2030. And then each measure of the framework for design excellence has a series of questions, right? Measure one, measure two, I'm gonna go back and do this in more detail, but just to give you the broad overview to begin with. Uh, measure three, design for ecosystems. And as you fill out the common app, this graphic called the spider graph at the top will auto-generate um, an output. Uh, basically, each of these 10 measures are scored um, based on your out, uh, on the questions in your input. Um, and the shape of the spider graph in the end gives the jury a general idea of the performance of your project at a glance. Um, the, the, the idea behind this is not to rank projects by EUI, for instance. It's not to say you got 7.5 points on resources and this other project got 
7.4. So this project wins the design, right? This is just one of many aspects that will be used to influence the jury's decision, to inform the jury's decision, to make sure that the all around best project is the one uh, that wins, right? This, this uh, common app combines narratives. There's plenty of narratives to describe what your attention, your design intent was, obviously photographs um, as always, and then the specific metrics. So this is a tool, hopefully um, it's useful for everyone, right? It's useful for the jury because they get to understand at a deeper level what your project does as opposed to just how the project looks. Um, it should be useful for the people filling out the form. Um, the 10 measures um, might not be completely um, understood or accessible to everybody yet. They're relatively new. This, the, the, the AI adopted this only in 2019. Um, and <laughs> we've all been busy in 2020 with, with various activities. Um, so um, if you haven't kind of engaged with the framework of excellence, the individual questions will really help you apply the measures to your project. Um, so as you're going through, again, fill out your intent, fill out the project, the project metrics as, as, as honestly and accurately as possible, knowing that this is not an objective way of scoring your, the, the value or the worth of the work. Um, and then some of the lessons you can, there's, there's uh, kind of useful information throughout the Common App that then you can take to your next project. So we do recommend both filling this out for the projects this time around, um, but thinking about future projects through the lens of the framework, through the lens of the Common App. Um, and, and my hope and the hope of the, of the developers of this tool is that not only will this help the jury um, make more informed decisions on awarding projects, but also help design teams design better projects moving forward. Okay, so that was kind of, that was the, the overview um, <clears throat> to get into the specifics. Uh, project, project name, client, if the project, if the client is confidential, you can click this little button, goes away. Um, for the address and climate zones, um, address is self-explanatory. The climate zones, we have two links. There's useful links over the side that will help you fill out some of your information. Um, for projects in California, there's California specific climate zones. Um, for projects outside of California, you can use the ASHRAE climate zones. These are both links to maps that'll help you understand that. Um, this next section, these three uh, or six boxes allows you to define the building type. And the building type is important because that will go ahead and define your energy benchmark. You don't have to, um, you don't have to uh, generate your own benchmark. Um, you, the, the software does it for you and it's based on target finder. Um, it should align, if not 100%, fairly close to the 2030 benchmark um, that hopefully many projects are attempting to um, respond to. So you have an option for a single building type. Let's say it's a single family house. Let's say it's a school. You would select the building type from this drop down, and then you would select 100 over here. But if it's a mixed use building, um, like this example that I have 50% multifamily, 10% restaurant, 40% retail, you just want to make sure that this is the breakdown of square footage for those various building types. If you have more than three, uh, just use the major three. And then you just want to make sure that that last number equals 100, because that means that all of your building has been accounted for. Uh, you can choose if the project's new construction, renovation, or interiors, um, site area, floor area, number of stories. You auto generate an FAR. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't uh, contribute to your scoring or anything like that. But it is useful information, um, either for the jury or just for the project team. Um, your permit year is important because that generates your 2030 benchmark. So if your permit year is 2020. Um, through, through today or through the future, the 2030 benchmark is an 80% reduction. Um, if it's 2015 to 2019, it's a 70% reduction. Um, if you're not familiar with 2030, uh, we can go over that more in the question and answer. There's a few more points on that, but you can see right over here, because I entered 2018, your um, 2030 benchmark is generated a 70% reduction. If I was to put in 2020, it would right over here would go to 80%. Generally, the gray fields are what you fill in. The white fields are auto-calculated, so those are locked. We'll go back to 2018. Okay, 
bequest the 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 form ask you if the firm is a signatory of the 2030 commitment. Um, the AIA um, strongly encourages this for all firms. Um, it does not influence your your scoring or jury selection at all, but it's kind of like a little a little poke to remind you. Um, and then was the project certified with a third party rating system? Rather than the drop down, you just fill it out um, yourself, the program in the year, if you've been certified. Um, if it's targeting or pending in the future, I would just leave that out. Okay, so that's basic, that's the boilerplate information. And now we're gonna get into the framework. So there's 10 different sections, one section for each measure. And these are the ones where the questions start to influence the spider graph on top. There are three overall questions during design for integration, just narratives. There's a project summary statement, a client impact statement, and a statement of design excellence. Uh, the first two are somewhat self-explanatory, so I'm going to dig a little bit into this third narrative under integration. I think this is an important one. Um, this is how the jury will understand what your project and what your design team is attempting to do from the perspective of sustainability, from the perspective of environmental design, design excellence. Um, this is important. This is like one of the most important metrics, or sorry, narratives in the in the whole program. And it's important that projects think about how their project does improve the world beyond the site. Um, I, I, I heard comments from the jury last year that a lot of project teams said things like, we're going to open up the building to connect with uh, the natural world. And like, sure, that's great if you have a luscious backyard, but that doesn't actually help the project from a sustainability standpoint. Um, what are you really attempting to do? How does the project conserve energy and provide comfort knowing that there might be inundation from wildfire smoke, right? Understanding that the climate will be changing over the next uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. What do you do to make sure that the project is part of the solution and not part of the pro problem while simultaneously adapting um, to ensure the building is useful and functional over um, the next number of decades over the useful life of the building. Um, oh, without, um, without guess, causing more harm. Um, so really, really important. Um, if your project team hasn't thought deeply about this question, um, it's time to do that. And it's time to do that for future projects as well. Okay, design for equitable communities is the second measure. This is broken down to a few broad categories. Community engagement, there's a drop down, which has kind of a, a way of self-assigning how engaged the community is during the design process. Um, and you can also um, back up your selection with a brief narrative about the stakeholders that you included. Justice and equity, super important. And the AIA is taking this topic incredibly seriously um, this year. Um, the idea here is that the project, all architectural well, projects, all architecture in general, um, should think of clients besides the person who's paying you. Um, so how does the project benefit those who are not directly associated with it? Um, so you have a yes or no, and then you can back that up. Transportation choice equity is how we're discussing what used to be alternative transportation. Um, obviously cycling, um, human scale, walkable neighborhoods, um, transit are all very important from a sustainability standpoint, but it's also incredibly important from an equity standpoint, um, providing choice for the people who use the building on how they can most effectively and safely and healthily get around. So we do ask for the walk score, the transit score, the bike score. These are all generated from a website. You can link here, uh, walk score will take you to the website and you get all three of those numbers. It's a score of zero to a hundred, closer to a hundred, the more friendly the site is to that specific uh, form of transportation, either walking, uh, bikes or transit. Um, we understand that there are rural projects, um, which, which are significant, and we don't want to say that's, that's not a good thing, um, that might have very low scores because there's just no public transportation going to the wilderness. But that doesn't mean that um, we still can't gain value from a project in these remote locations. So you have an option to just describe why the walk score, the bike score, or the transit score might not be applicable to your project, and that's okay. And then finally, a narrative. Each of these sections ends with a single narrative. Um, and there's a few prompts. There's not a single thing that you have to discuss in these narratives, 
but what did your project do for equitable communities, right? The next one, ecosystems. What did your project do for ecosystems? Um, and again, you can answer one or more of these questions. We want to keep these pretty short, so just like two or three sentences. Um, the jury doesn't have time to read a thousand um, long paragraphs, nor do the design teams have time to write them. Uh, so just what is most important to your project is as brief and as impactful as possible. Each of these measures also has the single phrase of what that measure of the framework for design excellence means, and then a link to the AIA toolkit for that specific measure to help you understand the deeper strategies. It can help, um, again, with designing your next project or just your, the prompts of how you answer some of these questions. All right, design for ecosystems. Um, questions uh, focus on the site, basically around the building. Right? Is this a rural site? Is this an urban site? Is it a suburban site? Um, was the site previously developed? Incredibly important. Um, the landscaping, are we looking at native plants or is it turf grass? Right? Does the project apply with dark sky standards? Um, does the project utilize bird-friendly design strategies? Both of those dark sky and bird-friendly design strategies, there's some links to help you understand those. Um, these are self-assigned questions. They're yes or no if you click on them. Yes, no. Um, and then there's a little description about how to know whether you should answer yes or no. Uh, but the general overarching theory is if you're answering yes and everything, you're probably being too generous to yourself. And if you're actually no to everything, um, you're probably being too tough on yourself. This is about intention. Um, and it's also about outcomes. So did you, was dark sky design strategies a important part of you? Was it discussed during the design process? Did you make intentional effort or intentional decisions to lead to that outcome? That's how you should be thinking about answering the yes or no questions. All right, moving on to water. Um, obviously incredibly valuable resource. Um, is stormwater managed on site? This is both stormwater and potable water use. Is potable water used for irrigation? Um, we should be moving away from potable water as the irrigation source, looking at either zero scaping or rainwater collection to feed the landscape for the most part. Um, is potable water used for cooling? Um, this is your mechanical system, whether you have a cooling tower or whether you have, uh, or what, if you do have a cooling tower, what type of water is being used, is being evaporated to keep the building cool? Um, rainwater collection, water sense got, um, equipment. So are you, using low flow fixtures inside of the building, generally, the, the yes or no. So the majority, the vast majority of them are the low flow fixtures. So again, yes or no questions. And then you can use the narrative either to explain any answers above or use answer any of the prompts. Design for economy is number five. Um, there's an auto-generated number over here, which is your occupants per square foot. And this is based on the occupancy input and the square footage that you put above. Nobody's judging you on this question, so don't worry if it's not exactly aligned with how you imagined it. Um, it's just from, from your inputs. Um, but we do ask a, an additional narrative here to describe the strategies you took to right-size the building, right? Um, always a larger building will use more resources, right? Both um, embodied energy, um, money, um, temp, uh, electricity and, and gas or just energy to heat or cool. Um, so there is economy in, in right sizing. That doesn't mean that every building should be as small as possible, but it should mean that it generally fits the program. So that's what we want to ask there. You can reference that number, this um, square feet per occupant number. Um, does the project address issues of affordability? If it's an affordable housing project, the answer is yes. If it's a um, a large single family resident, the answer is probably no. Um, and any other building building type or type of building between the two, it's did you focus on that as a primary um, kind of design move? Um, is the building flexible? Does single spaces address multiple purposes? Um, another really important use of flexibility. This could either be um, a classroom building where you have kind of innovative scheduling to allow more classes to use fewer spaces, or it could be a multi-purpose space um, that might be one thing during the day and one thing in the evening to avoid having to build two, two spaces. And then finally, a cost per square foot. This is also auto-generated. 
from the numbers you put above. Um, if it comes out to $1,000 a square foot, which is not unusual in, in, um, in some urban markets, again, nobody's counting that against you, but it is a number that's worth looking at and referencing. Uh, and you can describe that below if you feel compelled to. Otherwise, that doesn't influence your score at all. Okay, energy. This is super important. Um, and energy has been around um, as kind of the major focus of sustainability and design, even before the framework for design excellence. So this is the most technical because it has been around the longest. Um, we asked for an EUI. It's really important that we're thinking about EUI. This is both for the 2030 challenge, for general energy conservation, for, for air pollution where you are in your local city or, or area, and then for climate change, right? Getting that carbon reduction as much as possible. So there's a drop down, and we ask that you select the code that the building was designed to. Um, going all the way back to IECC 2006, hopefully nobody is submitting a building designed to that code. Uh, but it also includes uh, Title 24 of various issue years, um, some Washington State, if you've done a building up there, um, and then the various ASHRAE. So there's a whole bunch. And if you don't have, if your selection is there, there's another option. Your benchmark, again, is auto generated from your building type. Um, and then this estimated EUI reduction based on code is um, what the various codes are expected to reduce your energy use by. So for instance, if you chose IACC 2006, that's typically um, going to be 10% better than the benchmark. But if you chose IACC 2018, right, the shifts, that's about 40% better than the benchmark or 45%. So this number, if you haven't measured your energy, if you haven't modeled for energy, this is the number that we're gonna use, just assumed energy reduction based on your, um, the energy code. On this question over here, you get to choose. Did you measure the energy? Did you model the energy? And if none, then again, the, the software falls back to the assumed reduction based on your code. So it's important to fill out your code. It's important to fill out kind of where your energy is from. Measured energy is the preference. And it's very easy to measure your energy. You add up utility bills for a year, you divide it by the square footage, there's your EUI and you can enter that number. It's much less um, expensive and time consuming than building an energy model. We always recommend energy modeling. But if you have both the measured and the modeled, you should just you should go with the measured. And if you only have the modeled, you would go with the model. Then if you have neither, again, we're going back to code. A bunch of auto-generated number. Uh, oh, you can put in, your EUI from renewables, which is subtracted to give you a net. Um, and then these numbers will auto generate kind of your net from your solar, um, if you have any, um, and your assumed EUI. Um, your reduction of the benchmark, whether or not you met 2030, it says no, because this is only 45 and it was 70 up above. And then the percentage of power generated by uh, solar. So none for this project. A few quick questions about how you use energy modeling. Um, so did you use energy models to inform design decisions or just as a compliance tool? And then you have that narrative. So before you go on, Corey, yes. um, I just want to take a moment on this one to really stress the importance of trying to get this right. Uh, as most of you probably know, we have a group of technical reviewers who look at the Common App and sort of score them on um, a one to five basis for the jury to use. And one of the things we look at extra carefully, the tech reviewers, is the EUI and the building performance. And um, we want to encourage you to dig in and make sure that you're getting it right. So if you don't have measured performance, um, make sure that the modeled performance that you're using is accurate and are the right kind of numbers. So you may need to talk to your mechanical engineer to do that or whoever did the energy model for you, uh, whether in-house or an outside consultant. If you didn't do any energy modeling, but you do have Title 24 data, we have on the website some converters that will help you convert the numbers that are in Title 24 to actual EUI. Uh, Title 24 reports in something called time-dependent valuation, which is a complicated form of UI that doesn't really uh, communicate much to anybody. So we have these instructions on how to use these converters and the converters so you get the right numbers. So again, I just want to encourage everybody to take special care with this and make every effort to try to get it right. Because if the numbers are way off, it will lower your technical score. And if you get a low technical score, you'll be less likely to get a design award. 
and we can answer questions about that when Corey finishes going through this. And there is a little link right over here, um, which um, goes to a resource to help you pull that EUI from your Title 24. Okay, four more measures. We have design for wellness. And this, again, a series of yes or no questions. It asks about your um, air filters. Um, were chemical of concern um, lists used, like a red list, or were you trying to avoid formaldehyde, for instance? Um, did you study strategies to optimize daylight within occupied spaces? Are there operable windows in your project? So a series of yes or no questions, and again, some explanations, um, and then a series of prompts for a narrative. Design for resources looks at a few different things, um, embodied carbon being the major one. So did the project conduct a life cycle analysis um, to understand the carbon impacts of the material choices? Um, if you did, you have an option to enter those results, um, numeric and the units that you used over here. Not That's kind of like a, a bonus. We encourage people to understand or, attend, or work to understand the carbon metrics because these are gonna become increasingly important, not counted in your score. Um, did you take deliberate steps to decrease the embodied carbon of your structural system, maybe through more efficient framing? Did you take deliberate steps to decrease the embodied carbon of your concrete admixture? Um, did you incorporate an existing building or do an adaptive reuse project? So a, a FSC certified lumber. So lots of important questions. Most of them, again, are, are yes and no. Um, and then you have a narrative that allows you to touch on any of these prompts or um, kind of add explanation to any of the questions above. Design for change. Um, this is looking at resiliency um, moving forward, but also the idea of long life loose fit. How can the project continue to be relevant through all sorts of changes that we're going to experience, um, both that we can anticipate and those that we can't. Um, again, looking back at 2020, this is incredibly important. Um, we were focused on a variety of potential future risks, but few people were focused on, on pandemics and there's big building implications um, to our health. Uh, so design lifespan of the building. How long do you, are you designing your building to last? Is it, um, is it gonna last centuries or is it gonna be demoed in like 25 years? Uh, future flexibility, is that built in, right? How effective can the building function without power? Or how was that thought about? If the power does go out, is the building still usable? Um, if your building's a glass box in either the North or the South, it's probably not usable without energy. If the building has kind of reasonable apertures and maybe even a little bit of thermal mass, it could probably maintain occupant comfort um, for a series of, for, for a, a, a significant amount of time without energy. Do you have backup power? That's another question. Um, and then we just ask a quick short answer. What is the, the major risk um, that your building is, is, is designed to deal with, right? If it's near a fault, it might be uh, structural stability for earthquakes. If it's near the coast, it might be adaptation for sea level rise. If it's near forests, it might be uh, protection against forest fires. So um, want to just, the project is going to self-assign kind of that risk so that the jury knows what they were thinking about. And also so the project team can start thinking about this moving forward. Uh, and then finally, design for discovery is the last measure. Um, was a post-occupancy evaluation performed your project? Um, did you survey occupants for their comfort or their satisfaction? Did you make improvements to the building based on these, these outcomes? So, um, so a few quick questions. I think that going back and understanding what you did in the past and then learning those lessons and moving them forward is how we can progress as a profession how we can continue to improve our, our projects. Um, and, and then again, um, we're gonna finish with a narrative uh, where you can go into more detail or respond to any of these prompts. So that is the whole Common App. Um, I hope that it doesn't seem um, overwhelming. It should not seem overwhelming. It's actually fairly simple. You read through it and then you Think about what your project did. It's a useful exercise. So if you don't do any sort of post-occupancy um, as part of your normal process in your office, um, it might even be a good opportunity to kind of like debrief on your project. Don't look at this as something difficult or onerous. Look at this as an opportunity to give the jury more information, to learn about your project, to reflect on your intentions, um, and then to think about how future work can align with the new framework for design excellence at the AIA. So that's what I had. Um, 
I think, Henry, are we ready to open up for questions? Yeah, we already have a few uh, typed in. So um, the first question is, if a project is higher education, do students count as people not directly involved in the project? Or would that only apply to, say, surrounding community users? Uses, sorry. That's an interesting question. And I, I, I feel that with many of these, um, they're open to interpretation. So um, it's, it's a great idea if you're designing a school to in, include students into the design process, get some thoughts for them. Um, but they are the primary occupants. So it is expected that you are designing with their health and safety and benefit in mind. So I would say you want to look at both of those. You want, the school should benefit the surrounding community and the school has to benefit the, the students. So the next question is um, the design questions, how do you answer those for a renovation project as opposed to a new building? The, which specific questions are different for renovation? I, I think they meant measure one, the, the narrative in measure one. Mm. Is that right, yes. Veronica? You'll have to just, um, well, Debbie, at this point, can we make it so that people, we can hear other people? Yeah, so I did unmute uh, Veronica if she wanted to clarify her question. I'm so sorry, can you repeat that question, what you asked? Uh, if you had a specific question that you were wondering how it applies to a renovation. Yes, towards the end when you were talking about the design, um, if you could scroll down to the checklist, there are specific questions that have to do with the design of the building itself. We're um, looking to submit a renovation where, I mean, we wouldn't necessarily be able to say was the building designed originally for like later you, if you go down, I think it's one more. Like Is it, it wasn't for designed for well-being, but we're kind of making those upgrades. And then it wasn't originally designed like for disassembly. No, <laughs> the steel structure. Um, and then the future flexibility design, like we're actually taking it and making it a college campus, so sort of, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the questions were designed to be as broadly applicable as possible for renovations for interiors projects. But I do understand that not 100% of the, the questions do align perfectly with those different project types. So I would say from the perspective of your renovation as a, as a completed project, right? Um, are you adding elements that might apply to some of these, these um, kind of um, these questions? So if we're looking at something like design for resources and there's a question about um, was um, effort made to decrease the embodied carbon of the structural system, maybe you didn't touch the structural system, so it's not relevant. But maybe you added, uh, I don't know, two columns out of, out of 100 columns, um, yeah. reference what you did. Not, not the building as a whole, because I think that's what we're, we're, we're looking at is the kind of the, the design intent is the most important. Okay. And, and one of the changes we made this year was to make sure every measure had a narrative box. So you could have the opportunity to explain, well, my project's a little different and here's why, uh, and here's how we approach this measure. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so the next question uh, is, how many chapters have instituted the Common App and what was the response from applicants to fill out the form? So, uh, so San Antonio was the first chapter um, and, and, um, and they instituted, this will be their third year. Um, so in, in, in San Antonio, everybody is very kind of comfortable with the Common App, it's expected. Um, we, we, we did do a similar webinar like this for the first two years and the third year, there actually wasn't even enough interest because people were so familiar with the concept, even though it's slightly updated. Since then, chapters around the country have been, have been using this. So, so Seattle applied it, California, obviously last year, uh, the state of Colorado also that last year, again this year, um, the major cities in Texas, um, Austin, Dallas, Houston, um, have also picked it up and, and statewide Texas is looking this year. New York instituted it last year, um, as did Philly. Both of them are doing it again this year. Um, so it is, it's fairly widespread. And the consistent feedback that I've gotten from the various chapters is people initially look at this as a difficult new onerous task. Um, 
and it could be a little bit intimidating. But the feedback of people who filled it out is it actually wasn't intimidating. It was actually fine, right? And actually it was a benefit because I got to get into more detail around um, kind of my project. I got to, um, I had the opportunity to share my thought process at a very granular level with the jury. Um, so I, I do think that anytime there's a change, um, people might be um, um, apprehensive, um, but I would say approach this if you haven't done it before, not as something new and difficult and required, um, but as an opportunity to share a different part of your thought process with the jury. Um, and um, it, it, a few years from now, I suspect that uh, we'll look back and think that it was crazy that we never asked questions about building performance or sustainability and design awards programs. So it is a little bit of a shift, but it should not be kind of an overwhelming one. And last year was the first year AIA California did it. Um, we, you know, we did another webinar like this and answered people's questions. Um, there were, most people filled it out pretty completely. There were not a lot of complaints about it. So I, I think it really is a pretty straightforward thing. And part of the idea is that there will be this application and this will be the only thing you fill out for every design awards program. So if you're submitting uh, a particular building for AIA California, but also for your local chapter and also for a national honor award that you only have to do this once. Um, and it'll be consistent across, eventually across all those um, different levels of the AIA. Yes, it's a little bit of a grassroots effort. So we're, we're moving, but that's, that's what we're moving towards. That's the goal. Henry, uh, this is Phil Burke. I just wanted to uh, reply and say, um, really don't think of it as onerous. You know, I mean, no one expects that you're going to say, yes, we did every one of these things. And really like with design for resources, on most projects, there is a good reason why you chose your structural system. Um, you know, that's kind of what we're trying to get at. Why did you choose this structural system? Did you try and design with, you know, an efficient use of the resource behind that structural system? We're not really, again, we're not sort of saying that you need to like have a stellar response on every one of these um, questions. We're really just trying to give you an opportunity to talk about um, more aspects of your design. Uh, you know, you, you typically do think about, well, with design for change, you know, where do we imagine this building being, you know, you know years ahead? Um, so if, if, you, if you're not comfortable, you know, with figuring out your reply to every individual question, as Henry said to a previous question, there's a, you know, you can provide a brief narrative answer. We're just, we're really just trying to give you an opportunity to talk about more things than just the look of the building and to sort of recognize that, um, Good buildings are about, certainly they are about how they look, but they're about other things as well. So that's what I want to input. So the, the next question is um, a very important one and I'm gonna ask Bill Burke to answer it, but before uh, uh, I have him do that, it's a question about EUI, who developed it and how does it work? I just wanna point out that there are some answers to that on the website already. If you look at the Design Awards uh, website, there is an article that Bill Burke wrote about what is EUI and understanding EUI. And it's there along with the uh, instructions and converters to convert Title 24 energy information into regular EUI. We're also putting a new tab under climate action on the AI California website that'll contain the same information about EUI called understanding operating energy. So we have it in a couple of places on the website. And with that, Bill, if you wouldn't mind taking on this question about understanding what EUI is and how does it work? Sure. Corey, can you scroll up to the energy section? Yep. Actually, maybe even to the uh, first section where it talks about where there's a mention of CBEX. Okay, so energy use intensity, it's, it's a metric that is how much energy is being used per square foot of building. So it's sort of like a, an energy density measure. Um, and obviously it is not gonna be the same for different building types. So um, as to 
it's been used for decades. I mean, honestly, I don't know who exactly um, first created the, the, the metric, but the, um, you know, the US government has done this commercial buildings energy uh, use survey for many decades. That's what CBEX is commercial building energy consumption survey. Um, and so by building type, they have gone out and you know measured the energy use of different building types, and they could say, in you know 2003, the average uh, building of this building type used this much uh, energy per square foot. They convert it. They take electric electricity and gas and convert it into one metric. Um, uh, thousands of British thermal units or kBTU per square foot. Um, and, and so the idea of EUI is if you understand what um, a building of your building type uses, you can have a, a better sense of sort of, are we sort of uh, a lot better than average, a lot worse than average um, or not. And ideally, you know, the, in the best of all possible worlds, you actually get that information from a utility bill after the building's operated. As architects, we don't always get that. So in a lot of times we're saying, we did an energy model to um, estimate what the energy use intensity uh, is gonna be for our project. And so that's, when we get to the design for energy, that's what we're asking you is, you know, um, how did you get this EY number? Um, is it, you know, is it pulled from a utility bill? Is it from a design model where early on, you know, you started doing some models um, and then at the end you kind of said, okay, now we sort of have the whole building together. What's our whole building energy is gonna be? Um, and then if you didn't do that, if you have a Title 24 compliance model, um, you can, using the, converter that Henry said uh, is available from the AI website, um, you can take data in your Title 24 report and um, create a um, EUI based on that. The issue with Title 24, as Henry said, is that Title 24, the Energy Commission, um, is looking at kind of the whole state's energy needs. And so for reasons really having to do with managing um, the whole utility grid, they actually, when, they when you do a Title 24 compliance model, the hour of the day in which you use the energy gets uh, a multiplier created by consultants to the CEC um, that basically sort of give more uh, importance to energy used in the late afternoon or early evening than to energy, say, in the middle of the night. So they apply these multipliers and it's used for the state's purposes, but a Title 24 EUI, as Henry said, is called time dependent valued. So for architects, for people sort of trying to compare um, a California TDV EUI against an average for a building type, it just doesn't work. Um, so that's why, you know, we, we ask you to use the converters to get it back to before those uh, multipliers were applied. So I'll go back to what I said initially. Energy use intensity is a measure of energy density per square foot. Um, it is really, you can only really apply a given building against other buildings of that same building type. The CBEX survey um, basically goes through uh, a range of building types and talks about what the average energy use for different buildings types was by square foot in 2003. And then the 2030 reduction targets are saying, we wanna use less energy per square foot in new construction projects now than we did in, in in 2003. So the intent is that you can compare a modeled EUI or a measured EUI taken from utility bills against how efficient a building, a typical building of that building type was in 2003. 
um, I've probably said enough, maybe too much. So I think I'll stop there. And if people have follow-up questions, I'm glad to answer them. And it is a little complicated, but the simplest way to think about it is miles per gallon for a car. This is the same thing you're measuring in a building. It's just, you know, how much energy does it use? And the, the simplest way to talk about that is on a per square foot basis. Yeah, and, it, and it's really, it's used by the federal government um, and it's used internationally by um, most energy uh, organizations just to sort of say, you know, uh, how are we doing against sort of a baseline for this building type? So. so we have one sort of related question, which is, um, is there a preference for a building to wait a year for measured data? Um, and I, I think the answer to that question is we don't really want to prevent anybody from submitting their new building because we know they're excited about it and they want to submit with only model data. So we don't want to discourage anybody from doing that. We're just saying that if you have the measured data, please use that instead. Or if you're submitting this year and you don't win an award and you use model data and you submit again next year and by then you've had a chance to track your data and include that, then switch it. Uh, don't use the modeled energy anymore, use, use measured. So that, that's the answer to that question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. What is the best argument and I think this meant for rather than from, for overcoming applicant reticence. Um, and Polly, can you unmute Polly, um, Debbie? And maybe she has a little bit more to say about that or ask about that. So I better understand the question. Polly, you're unmuted. Hi, uh, I think this was really um, addressed after I wrote this because uh, the arguments for uh, convincing people that this is a good way to look at their project and that it's happening all over the country and that it is um, uh, happening in the other award um, um, efforts that people might be applying to are very good arguments. Um, but if you have more to say on that, it's great because I I think um, the, the harried single practitioner, which is the most common person in our chapter, is going to look at this and be horrified. <laughs> I think I, I, would just horrified. <laughs> I would just reiterate what I said earlier, which is, um, you know, these are categories that, you know, the AIA is kind of defined as part of design excellence. And um, in a way, I would say the simplest thing for someone reluctant to do might be to write the narrative for each section. It's only, you know, in, in most cases, it's a hundred word max. So it's not uh, a lengthy thing. Um, and then answer the questions to the fullest extent possible. Um, it's not, we're really not Again, we're not saying you've got to like, you know, be doing every one of these things. We're really just trying to sort of actually make it easier for people to sort of see, oh, well, we actually, yeah, we did something there and we did something there. But it might be easier really to reverse engineer it, like I said, write the narrative and then answer the rest of the questions. That's a great okay. idea. Okay. I also want to share that a lot of chapters initially when they uh, kind of adopt this process had been nervous about decreasing the number of award submissions because um, in many chapters submissions um, are provide significant funding for for AIA operations um, and because of the sensitivity around that we've been tracking it and we haven't found any evidence from any chapter um, that the common app has decreased the number of submissions. Um, so it, it might it might be a, a learning curve initially, um, but it's it's really not that hard, and um, there hasn't been um, there hasn't been an overwhelming number of questions, and there hasn't been any reduction in submissions from from the other chapters that I've that I've worked with. Corey, the one thing I'll add is um, the one measure that does take a little more time, as Henry said, is the design for energy one because you know. It is sort of asking you for your energy use intensity. It's asking you to sort of, you know, come up 
uh, with, as Henry put it, sort of a miles per gallon number for your design. Um, and you know, you can either do that by uh, getting the utility bill after the building's been open for a year, and we realize that's not doesn't happen that often. Um, it could be that, particularly on a larger project, uh, or a, a, a design engineer, or an energy modeler, or in some cases, somebody in an architect's office um, did a, an energy model used during design which then can also sort of be, okay, in the end, here's what we think it's gonna use in KBTU per square foot and the software, you know, will generate that number for you. Or if you didn't do that kind of energy model, you know, if it's really a smaller project, but you, you, but you use Title 24 uh, performance path, that's where you can pull numbers out of the Title 24 report, um, and enter them into the calculator on the AIA website to get uh, an estimated EUI. And then if, if you comply prescriptively, just say that, you know? But really what I wanna say is this is the one where to me it is the one area where you do have to do a little work. You can't answer it probably in 10 minutes. You know, you gotta, you, you gotta do a little work. So just um, be prepared for that. We have a, a couple of questions about measure eight, um, and I wanted to get to those before we ran out of time. The first is how do we deal with a hybrid structural system? For example, mass timber and steel for measure eight. And the second is, is there a tool for embodied carbon results or units? So uh, I'll, touch on the, I'll touch on the first one, the hybrid system kind of with a broader answer. Um, when developing the Common App, we had to make a choice between simplicity or depth. Um, and because we can't address every single unique case, we wrote the questions in a way that were more straightforward for the vast majority of projects out there. So the, the, the hybrid structural system is an analogy for every hybrid system on every question. Um, and what I would say is use some discretion when you're filling out the, the common app. Um, is, the, is the structure 80% uh, mass timber and 10% steel? Is the structure 85% steel and 15% mass timber? I think that matters. I would go with the predominant structure. Is it a 50-50? Uh, go with mass timber because that's, that's significant that you, that you did as much as, um, as, as much as that, as that kind of that unique building type. Um, but the questions are not meant to be overly specific. The questions are not meant to kind of uh, penalize design choices or be any sort of cutthroat in any sort of way. It's not a lead checklist, right? The sustainability in my mind is not um, numeric answers to very specific questions. It's design intent. Um, and this is very much a design intent tool. There is some kind of numerics in the background because that helps to generate the spider graphic, which we found is very useful for juries. Um, but, but approach this, approach each question with discretion and think about um, your intent and the outcomes of your project um, and what you were able to achieve and what you were attempting to achieve. So I hope that answers the question about, about hybrid systems in general. Um, there is a very specific question why this was not an overly numeric document, which, which Obviously, it could have been. Um, and is there a tool for embodied carbon? Or are we still using the build carbon neutral tool? So the previous version had build carbon neutral as kind of the default mm -hmm. input. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's buildcarbonneutral.com. Um, basically, you put in a few metrics. What's your primary structural system, the square footage, number of stories, and a little bit on your landscaping. Um, and it generates a number. And it is so simple. Um, that, um, that you would have to assume that the number is far from the truth, but we did a series of analyses and you can do a very technical embodied carbon analysis with Tally or Athena. Um, and the build carbon neutral is actually not that far off because structural system is the overwhelming driver of most projects in embodied carbon. Um, and there's a big difference between using wood or concrete or steel. Um, so if you've never used, if you've never, done anything with embodied carbon before, I recommend you visit buildcarbonneutral.com and just play around with it. Um, uh, worst case scenario, you better understand the metrics and the orders of magnitude 
that these num that these um, that carbon is is used is that are used to analyze carbon, um, and then again Tally or or Athena or or Gavi or one click LCA are some more technical um, embodied carbon analysis tools, which we think are going to become increasingly significant um, um, in the future. Though they're kind of kind of the, the very tip of the iceberg right now. And Corey, this is Bill again. I just want to stress again, I don't think any of us expect everyone to be like doing this incredible puts, you know, stellar work on embodied carbon. As Corey said, there's a recognition that it's really important. Um, it's a recognition that structural systems are have a really big impact. And it's also kind of a hard one at this point for most architects to really get a, a detailed handle around. So there are these sort of tools to help you estimate it. Um, but if you have not been able as a single practitioner, say, to really address it much, no one is gonna, you know, it's not like a deal breaker. Just, you know, we're, we're trying to get at emerging issues and give you an opportunity to say you addressed it if you were able to address it. I'm done. There's one last question, and um, I'm going to answer it very briefly because we're about out of time, which is, is there a section for active design um, or is biophilia something only for a narrative? I would say at this point, it is something for the narrative. There are no specific questions about it at, at this point. So please, if you have something to report on that, I'm sure jurors would be interested in hearing about it. So please do include it in your narrative. Um, so this, Debbie, will be posted on the website. Uh, maybe you could tell us it'll be posted, the video for this will be posted under Design Awards. And how soon will you be able to post that? Um, it'll be on our uh, Design Awards page later today. So by end of day, Great. five o'clock today. Okay, so there. somebody did ask if they wanted other people to be able to view it. That's where you will be able to find it. Yes. Um, so There's I, a I link just... in the chat also for that page. Great, Great. okay. So I really wanted to thank Corey for taking the time, first of all, to put this together. Second of all, to listen to our uh, inquiries about how to revise it and all the work you've put into revising it. We really appreciate uh, all the work that you've put into this. So thank you again for doing this for us today. And thanks to Bill and, and Jennifer Devlin for joining us to, to help answer questions. And I also wanna finally thank our partners at Pacific Gas and Electric one more time. Um, any last minute questions? We have about one more minute. Okay, hearing none, I think we'll call it. Thank you very much, everybody. We appreciate your attendance. If you do come up with more questions, don't hesitate to uh, reach out to Debbie Salindo at AIA California and she'll pass those questions on to us and we'll do our best to answer them for you. So thanks everybody and uh, have a good afternoon.